Avast me parties. Aaron's the name, and I be a children's programming librarian at the Kingwood Branch Library. R and I be Amy Campbell, the captain of the Bear Creek Tall Ship. I mean library. And I'll explain why my hat doesn't match the voice later. <laughs> <laughs> this here be a workshop for the HCPL rights with a mind to discuss character. This is a part of our new monthly program for writers all across the county. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from and what you like to write. Of course, your characters might not have a pronounced voice like a pirate or a cowboy, but character voice is still an important thing to think about. It's most important for first person narration, but character dialogue is also impact. Now, I think we all have books that we have read where the character's voice made the book for us. So what are some of your favorites for our uh, watchers out there? Um, let us know in the comments. So how about you, Erin? What are some of your favorites? Actually, we're going to be listening to excerpts from a few of mine today. I love books that are narrated by dogs. And I think I've only got one of those, but there are many of them in the kidding department. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, and does this one have that? So anyway, on and as a children's librarian, I know a lot of them. I also like the voice in the Arusha books by Roshani Chokshi and Okay for Now by Gary Schmidt. Um, so yeah, sorry. How about you, Amy? Well, I know you mentioned the voices of dogs. So speaking of dogs, um, I really love the voice of Oberon, the Irish wolfhound. He's a character in Kevin Hearn's Iron Druid Chronicles. Um, he has a really unique voice. He's just a lot of fun to read. Um, anybody who listens to the audiobook of that, uh, Luke Daniels, who narrates it, does a fabulous job of uh, his, his canine voice. And since I'm a fantasy reader and a writer, I also love a lot of the character voices used by Robin Hobb in her Realm of the Elderling series, which includes uh, the Fits and the Fool series. So let's see if we have any comments. Let's see, we see that Molly says hello. So hello, Molly, we're glad you could join us. And it looks like there's not any new comments yet, but please feel free to let us know some of your favorite character voices. Um, we'll uh, mention those as we see them. Co the comments come in. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind when thinking about your character's voice, including their age, education and interests, um, where they're from and who they spend time with, and even the character's personalities will impact the way they talk. Now, if you would like, tell us about some of your characters that have a particularly distinct voice and how you developed it. And before we uh, talk about um, some of Aaron's characters in mind. I see Taylor says that her favorite character voice is Hagrid from the Harry Potter series, and that's a really good example of one. Yeah. All right, so Aaron, um, what are some of your favorite characters that, that you've written in their voices? So one of my favorite characters is in my pirate story. They're not really pirates, but you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, her name is Arissa. Oh dear, nice. And uh, Arissa, uh, English, well, what passes for English in the book is her, <laughs> is her, not her first language. It's not even her second language. And I enjoy her word choice because she's really good at communicating, but sometimes she uses turns of phrase that are a little bit um, non-standard. <laughs> and mm -hmm. sometimes 
she um, makes some mistakes. And I think that it shows a lot about her character because she's clever enough to hold a complex conversation in a language that she basically picked up on the ship. And so I think that it's interesting to see her and like the way her mind works, the way she communicates sometimes. Another character I really love is Breer. And Breer is a character who keeps very quiet around the people she works with. So she has two different voices in the story. When she's around people who she's trying to, um, who she's trying to like be, who she's shy around, she speaks differently than when she's around her brothers who are in the story and some of the other characters who she feels like she can be more open with. Very cool. Those sound like really interesting characters. Oh, and we got a comment from Molly. Molly says one of the favorite of her favorite characters is Captain Hook and Peter Pan. He's very proper while being very evil. He is highly educated, but somehow became one of the most feared pirates of the seas. It's true. He's got a good piratey voice. Yeah, he, he really does. That's a really great example, especially with uh, this being, well, we're not really doing it on Talk Like a Pirate Day, but that's kind of where our theme is for this month, too. <laughs> yeah, he's a very good pirate example, too. Oh, you know, kind of thinking of that, it's not really a book, but I really like the the character voice of, like, Captain Jack Sparrow. Because, well, actually, that they did make books about him, too. So he's got a really great pirate voice, too. That's true. He's got a very distinct one. phrasing. <laughs> Yes, very, very distinct. <laughs> so are there any of your characters you're particularly proud of their voices? I am, and that's kind of why I have my cowboy hat on today. Um, so for me, I try to make my characters as individual as I can to kind of bring them alive for my reader. So one of the characters in my story um, is a magical outlaw named Jack, and he speaks with a Texas twang. Uh, even though he's in a fantasy world, uh, my story's kind of set in a second world Old West style type of uh, setting. So I researched phrases that would fit in his speech patterns right down to the way um, he thinks about things because I write a third person limited perspective. Um, and he's a fun contrast actually to two of my other characters. So Blaze is one of the other main characters. He, um, he will also say some like tex Texas centric things like howdy but he's not quite as rough around the edges as Jack and he tries to keep to himself more. Um, and my other third character, Jefferson, he's more affluent. Um, so his speech and his mannerisms are a lot crisper and more formal and uh, much more proper than like the things that Jack or Blaze will say. So they kind of all have differences from each other, which makes them a lot of fun. All right, it looks like we don't have any more comments, so. But feel free to tell um, us about your characters, because we'd love to hear about the characters that our, our uh, watchers are writing about. I think that that's really interesting when you have third person narration and you have like the contrast going on between the sections. I really like it when authors do that, so I'm sure it's a lot of fun to switch. Yeah. I, I'm the type that I can't write uh, in in one headspace, so I have to like jump between different heads and different scenes. So that that's the way I do it. Makes it more oh. fun. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> All right, so we'll be using some examples from popular books today. Although this is an adult program, many of them will be from children's books because often these let us illustrate points more quickly. Also, as a children's librarian, I feel like everyone can benefit from reading a children's book from time to time. And it can also be a challenge to display a voice when you're writing for children. There's tools that make it easier, like complex vocabulary words and excessive profanity. Um, those are all off limits when you're writing for kids. But the techniques for children's books that authors use to display a voice are great for anyone. So no matter what audience you're writing for, you can employ those same tactics for a any audience, whether it's juvenile or adult or teen. So we're also going to be doing three writing exercises today um, that will go along with the subjects that we're discussing. So our first example is from Alvin Ho. Here's my, my kind of beat up library copy. <laughs> 
Allergic to Girls, School, and Other Scary Things by Lenore Look. So I'm going to be reading a part that's near the beginning where Alvin Ho is talking about things that you should know about him. Okay. The fourth thing you should know about me is that I love Plastic Man, Wonder Woman, The Green Lantern, Concrete Man, Aquaman, King Henry V, and all the superheroes in the world. I know them from reading with my dad every night while my mom runs on the treadmill like a hamster on a wheel. My dad is a great reader for his age, which could be 50 or 100. It's hard to tell. He wears reading glasses and always puts one arm around me and his other arm around Antebelli and Calvin for support. On account of when you get to be that old, it's hard to do anything by yourself. So I love this book because Alvin has such a clear voice and the whole thing is in first person. So you get to hear a lot of his voice and you can tell a lot about him from that passage and a lot about his family. What I think is particularly great is the way there's information he's clearly getting a little bit wrong and the reader knows it. Especially with his, the age of his parents because yeah, he, he had a, a wide uh, plus or minus percentage of er error there. <laughs> um, there's a few ways that Lenore Look shows Alvin's voice, including his word choice and the phrases he uses. And some of the other ways we can show our character's voice include using slang, um, the sentence length, and the use of contractions or other verbal shortcuts. So think about those whenever you're crafting your characters. With those in mind, let's try our first writing exercise. So for our first writing exercise, we're going to let our characters talk about a hobby. The way they talk about it can tell us a lot about them. Have they got formal training or did they teach themselves? Do they call all the tools by the proper name or do they call it the what's it? Um, so we're going to set a five minute timer and once we get that going, we're going to all start writing about our characters talking about a hobby. Any moment now, we'll have our trusty timer up there to get us going. Remove my pirate hat here. Oh, <laughs> you know I'm caught. There's our trusty timer. All right. Happy writing, everyone. Don't forget to write about the hobby.
Time's up. How did everybody do? Did you write something, Amy? I did after I went to fix my hat hair. <laughs> did you write anything, Erin? I did. Um, would you like to share? Sure, I certainly will. Um, let me see. I managed 88 words, which wasn't too bad for running out of the room to check on my hair. Um, so I wrote Blaze having a conversation with someone about his favorite hobby, which is baking. So here we go. Hand me the pastry jigger. But Blaze made a vague gesture toward the end of the counter where a range of diff different implements sat. Jefferson stared at the items in bewilderment as Blaze continued with his work on the pie crust. I'm sorry, the what now? Blaze grinned, looking up from his work. The pastry jigger, the thing that, well, I guess it looks kind of like spurs, but it's not spurs. Understanding flashed in Jefferson's <laughs> eyes, and with the description in, in mind, he, sele he selected the pastry jigger and brought it over. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I like it. How about it. you? What did you write? Um, I wrote from my character Silva's point of view, and Silva is a storyteller um, and she does she does other things like she has other ambitions but her grandmother was a storyteller and she learned how from her grandmother so I, I can read a little tiny excerpt because you know I trail off in the middle so but <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother was better at it of course I don't suppose she ever got bored of the so stories being the same over and over. She didn't change them. It isn't that I don't think the stories were good the way she told them, but somehow I can't help myself. When I see Philip, the tanner, sitting and listening, the tailor at the center of my story suddenly becomes a tanner. It's easier for me to picture that way. I bet it's easier for Philip to picture that way too. I like that. That's a, that's a fun one too. Silva's well, let's fun. see. Ooh, and I think we have some in our chat sharing too. Ah. So it looks like Molly wrote with us. Molly wrote, Ruby hadn't thought about twirling since high school. Once she graduated, all those hobbies were thrown out the window when she had married her high school sweetheart and immediately started a family. She had left the world of twirling and glee clubs for diapers and cooking meals. Oh, Ruby, I hear that. Um, <laughs> that was my aside. Now, three <laughs> ladies were expecting her to lead them through twirling. How Willa, the eight, eight plus year old woman, would twirl from her wheelchair. Ruby wasn't sure. She hadn't done choreography before. Their coach had always done that. Now Ruby was team captain and coach. She dug through the back of her closet looking for old batons. Oh, that sounds adorable. I love the sound of that, Molly. Thank you for sharing. And you made my kind of typo because I bet that's an 80-year-old woman and not an 8-year-old woman in a wheelchair. I could see an 8-year-old in a wheelchair twirling. <laughs> well, that was fun. So if y'all see, if y'all want to share anything else y'all have written, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll read it when we can. Oh, and Molly also wrote 700 words. So excellent job, Molly, in five minutes. That was oh, great. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Character voice doesn't just affect your dialogue or your first person narration. It can also impact the way you write when you're using third person with a limited perspective. So a great example of this that I read recently is this young adult fantasy book. There we go. A Dark and Hollow Star. Um, in this excerpt, we're going to hear from two of the main characters and also the antagonist. So we get a variety of voices, although this isn't one of the, the main uh, characters' point of view. Hello, said Arlo to the middle-aged man who approached her counter. What can I get for you today? A latte. Arlo suppressed a sigh. One of the drawbacks to customer service was having to deal with people in a bad mood, as this man clearly was. In his midnight black suit, black leather gloves, and a sharp gold tie paired with perfectly groomed, glossy black hair, he gave off the air of someone important. And with the sour turn of his pinched mouth and the glittering hard stare, he was clearly an unhappy someone important. <laughs> Best to move this one along quickly. Juan Latte! She punched it in. What name can I write on the cup? 
hero. His frown etched further into a scowl. Your customer service is atrocious. I'm sorry? She had no idea what she'd done to offend him. The man was clearly looking for someone to take out his mood on. You know, you should smile more. Girls are much prettier when they smile. And you would certainly use that help. To think I came all, all this way for this... I don't even know what he sees in you. You aren't a threat to me at all. Uh, was this still about her? So you can pick your drink up over there. That's all you have to say? Goodness, girl, I'm insulting you. Don't just, my dude, drawled a voice from behind the man. Methinks that Lady doth say leave off. <laughs> Arlo's heart tripped over its own beat. Her eyes grew wide. Her breath tangled up in her throat and caused her to choke on a cough because she knew that voice would probably never forget for its haunting new role in narrating her previous night's nightmares. And when the man at the counter turned around, it was indeed Nausicaa standing next to mine. Excuse me? Nausicaa beamed. Arlo hoped to never witness her do so again. It was more than a little terrifying to see such threat behind false cheer. You heard me. Pay for your drink and move along. It's my turn to ter terrorize the barista. You will regret talking to me like that. Um, should I? Promises, promises. Take your mood and go. At the end of that segment. So now it's time for another writing exercise. Okay, for our second writing exercise, write a passage in third person about someone about something going wrong for the character. Let the character voice impact the language. Let the let's get five minutes on the clock and see you in five minutes. Happy writing.
All right, time's up. How did everyone do? Please tell us in the comments. And if you want to share an excerpt, you're welcome to do so. Um, did you have any luck, Erin? A little bit. I got a little bit of writing. How about you? Oh, man, that was a hard one because I'm in, like, editing mode right now with my book. So editing mind is, like, a different mind than, like, just word vomit mind. So I got, like, just a couple of sentences, 43 words, so not really good for me. But I sat here with, with my brain going buffering for a little bit. <laughs> oh, dear. Sometimes that happens. Anything you want to share or is it just kind of not? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and share the little bit I got because I went ahead and wrote something. Um, even though, like, you wouldn't probably know from anything I ever share here, but Blaze has magic, but I just write about him baking all the time in these events <laughs> anyway. Um, so here he is talking more about baking. This is a nightmare. Blaze scowled as he stared into the bag of flour. He'd been so certain it had been tightly closed. How had the weevils gotten into it? And the mercantile was out of fresh flour. He ground his teeth together. And then if I had more time, I was going to write about one of his co-workers telling him to, like, go next door to the diner because they have flour and they would like lend them a cup. So, you know, it was all going to be good. <laughs> How about you? What did you write? Um, I wrote a little bit about Gabriel and well, I'll, I'll read it. Um, Gabriel tried to think for a moment about the worst day he'd ever had before leaving home. Not the day he proposed to Eliza or a day that anybody had died the worst normal day. What had happened? And it probably involved his brothers bully being bullies or his mother being worried over something silly. It had not involved Kraken. <laughs> Gabriel's the person who, he's a shoemaker who got sort of kidnapped by the pirates. He's, oh, that's what I remember you talking about Gabriel before. Yeah, I like him. I like the idea of a shoemaker with the pirates. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he's he's going to have to deal with, with a kraken. It's <laughs> well, but it's an actual kraken. You know, maybe he could make nice shoes out of it. I, I'm not sure if, if there's such a thing as kraken leather. I'll have to think on it. <laughs> <laughs> if it were like a, an RPG game, they make leather out of everything. So, you know, you could have kraken leather. <laughs> I'm sure. Does anybody else have anything to share? I don't see anything coming through the chat yet, but people are welcome to um, put in if they're writing in there and we'll, at, we'll uh, talk about it whenever we see it. All right. Well, I will start on our next. Okay. For our last example, we're going to go head back to the world of children's books. And this one's going to have a dog. <laughs> so All right. I'm going to talk about a book that I love because of the contrasting character voices. And they provide a lot of humor. This book is Wedgie and Gizmo by Suzanne Selfors. Wedgie is a corgi who thinks he's a superhero. <laughs> and Gizmo is an evil genius who happens to be a guinea pig. All right. So let's listen to the different ways that Wedgie and Gizmo describe two of the human characters in the family. All right, starting with Gizmo. Until three days ago, Elliot was a loyal servant. He provided clean shirted newspaper, fresh water, and alfalfa pellets that were bland, but contained a balanced ratio of vitamins to minerals. In addition, Elliot oiled my exercise wheel so it did not squeak and washed the windows of my echo habitat so that I could enjoy the view. He gave me a pair of glasses so that I could watch the nightly news. From the comfort of my nest, Elliot never tried to squeeze me into a tutu. The new girl's name is Jasmine. I am not fond of her. I do not understand why she must pick me up and kiss me whenever she walks into the room. It is most unpleasant. And why must she carry me around in her pocket and sing songs to me? My time is valuable. I am an evil genius with important evil work to do. 
<laughs> All right. And then I'm going to read a segment from Wedgie's point of view. So, all right. Here's Wedgie. My name is Wedgie, but my full name is Super Wedgie. I got that name because one night, a long time ago, Jasmine tied a red cape around my neck and took me all around the to all the houses in the neighborhood. At each house, I got a pat on the head, and Jasmine got treats that she put in a bag. There were lots of scary people wearing masks, but I barked at all of them and kept Jasmine safe. And when we got back home, I chased all the mask-wearing people out of the yard. The cape gave me superpowers. Now I wear it all the time. It helps me protect Jasmine and the rest of my pack. There used to be three people in my pack. Mom and her two pups, Jasmine and Jackson. But my new dad and his pup, Elliot, moved in. So now there are five people in my pack. It's my job to guard them from enemies and invaders. It's also my job to herd them so they don't get lost. It's a big job, but somebody's got to do it. And I'm that someone. Me. Super wedgie. What a great day. Let's go, people. Let's go outside. <laughs> I love All that. Right. I love the difference of the two voices between like the the, the brooding evil genius and the, the, the obviously very, very much dog-like dog. -like dog. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can just picture like dogs in my acquaintance when I read Reggie's sections because <laughs> so, um, and, and like you can tell from uh, you can tell from the sections where Wedgie's talking that he's just really happy about everything. Like every now and then he talks about something like the vet and like he's not happy about that, but generally he bounces back pretty quickly. He's like an optimist about everything and like he's so willing to welcome these new people into his pack he's like you know he's very open he's very he, he's i mean not the people wearing masks but he's willing to like invite people into his family and you can tell that he's maybe not as intelligent as gizmo but that he has a lot more fun <laughs> So, and probably a lot more heart too. Yeah, he's a lot definitely more caring. <laughs> yeah, he, he's he's um, and you can tell that Gizmo kind of prides himself on his intelligence, but he's not really the sort of well, I don't want to say person, the sort of guinea pig to like roll with the punches to accept change. So, <laughs> well, that was and a fun have... excerpt. I like that one. We have an excerpt from Molly that we missed, or well, that came in after we started, so. Yes, and actually I think some of it in the view that you can see got cut off, Erin, but I, I can read the whole thing from Facebook. Okay. Tonight. So this is about something going wrong. The day had not started out the greatest with a flat tire, but Ruby fixed the tire and then went on with her day. She had run her errands and then gone over to see Frank and Inez. She helped them prepare meals for the week, uh, given Inez's hair a trim and done a bit of cleaning for them. Now she was ready to head home. Ruby got into her 1971 lilac colored Volkswagen bug and turned on the engine, but the engine didn't turn over. She tried again. There was not a sound coming from the bug. Ruby sighed and banged her head down on the steering wheel a few times. Why now? Oops, sorry, why? Why now? She just wanted to go home. Any repair shop would be closed by now and she was an hour away from home. If she called anyone for help, it would take them an hour to get to her. Ooh, so that's very much a rough day. Yeah. With a lot going wrong. Yeah. Starts poor, out bad, gets a little better, and then it gets worse. Poor Ruby. We have, we have all been there, man. Sorry about that, Ruby. <laughs> oh, her day gets better, too. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that, Molly. That was a lot of fun to read, too, despite Ruby having a rough day. Um, now for our final writing exercise, we're going to have our characters describe someone. A family member, maybe, or someone they're close to. The things they notice or decide to share are a reflection of what the character finds important. So um, just again, for those who might have missed it, we're writing about your character describing someone, maybe like a family member or someone they're close to. 
So we're going to be writing for five minutes and then we will share um, our writing after the prompt. Happy writing.
All right, time's up. How did everybody do? How did you do, Amy? So I managed to get a little bit of writing in. I did 63 words, so not great. I'm definitely not in the writing mindset, but not bad for like starting and like with only like two minutes left. So how about you, Erin? I did get something. For a minute, it was hard for me because mon most of my characters like don't end up describing people who they already know. So I was like, thinking, I mean, you know, in a story, they'll just often in the beginning, they'll describe like their loved ones, especially a children's book. But like, I couldn't think of a situation where one of my characters would be describing somebody they already knew. But then I, I, I came up with something after I thought for a while. Would you like to share what you wrote? Sure, I will. And I kind of had the same problem as you because like, not only am I in the editing mindset, but so I'm editing book two, which means the characters are all very familiar with each other. Like no one's had to think about how anybody looks. And I'm also one of those authors that like, I like I like to let the reader kind of build their own ideas for my characters. So I was like, oh my gosh, like who am, who am I going to describe? So um, I had Blaze kind of have a little paragraph about uh, Emrys, who is his Pegasus. And I didn't get very far because I kept like deleting stuff, which you shouldn't do when you're like writing like this, but I. I'm an editing brand, so I kept like fixing things. Um, but here's what I wrote. Emrys was the best friend an outlaw could have. At 17 hands tall, he was one of the largest st stallions of the flight, but that wasn't what set him apart. No, it was his undying loyalty and his legendary sweet tooth. But Blaze didn't mind that, and in fact enjoyed coddling his Pegasus with, with whatever leftovers hadn't sold at the bakery that day. So as you can see, that they get along well. <laughs> yeah, a baker and a Pegasus with a sweet tooth would be a pretty good combination. But they are BFFs. <laughs> so yeah, I managed to squeak something out there. So yay for me. But how, how about you? What did you write, Aaron? Well, okay. So it, probably I'll never be published, but I got to say that what I wrote is a pretty big spoiler for the book. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, we need to so, like, put, put the flashing spoiler alert up there. Yeah, but it's <laughs> you know, the girl's face was dirty. Her hair was matted. She wore a coat two sizes too big for her. But Breer knew the curve of the cheek, the turn of the nose. Her eyes were darker than her mother's, more hazel than green. But she would have known the face anywhere. She walked by the portrait a hundred times. This was Princess Quirna's daughter. This was the lost heir. Breer fell to one knee in front of the ragged girl and put her hand on her chest. My lady. So that's Ooh. like supposed to be like the, there's like this like ragamuffin character who's like causing Gabriel trouble on the pirate ship. <laughs> and then when Breer meets her, she's like, hey, it's the princess. And everyone's <laughs> like, what? Ooh, I love that. It's like that, that's the big reveal. That, that's really cool. So. You need, you need to keep working on it, get it published, and then, like, you know, a couple of years from now, we'll all be like, that's the I thing know. I've heard at that program that one time. <laughs> so I think maybe we should talk about um, the books that we talked about today and, like, try to give everybody the most time possible to put their their um, their comments in if they haven't sent their comments yet. So yeah, because we're, we're still watching that last too. slide and while they while and give people just a little more time. Maybe. Yep. Although I also see it looks like Molly just put hers in here. So oh, okay. Let, let me read That's what Molly wrote. Really Molly's really written reading. some really fun stuff today. Um, she did 171 words. Oh, and she asked. Oh, uh, sorry, G G Galley Roses asked, does a narrator count as a character? And it depends on your point of view. Um, well, actually, if you're doing a first person or third person limited, like I do, your narrator does count as a character. So you can definitely do that. And Molly wrote 170 words and hers says, Joya sat on the stone wall in the garden next to the big house. She watched Edmund as he worked on his loot. Having spent the last few weeks in his company, she had gotten to know some of his mannerisms. He was sitting on the ground with his lute on his lap and a bowl of oil by his side. He would dip the rag into the oil and very carefully rub it in circular motions on the backside of the rounded lute. 
She knew that he hummed when he would work and when the breeze blew just right, she heard his deep voice humming a slow tune. His dark hair that wasn't covered by the deep green scarf curled and danced in the breeze. What was always so striking to her about Edmund, though, was his eyes. They were a blue as bright as a summer day, and while beautiful, always had a way of looking as if they were looking right through her, right into her very soul. Mm. I really enjoyed that, Molly. That was very poignant. And I have to like give you mad props about like maybe you've got like a musician in your family, but knowing like about oiling the loot and stuff, like I would have gone down a Google rabbit hole and then written like two birds after that. So uh, <laughs> I salute you for that. Yeah, I had to true. go like a little chicken because I knew Blaze had used it earlier and I had to like know what it looked like. So that's where I've been. <laughs> And if anybody else has something to share, we would love to read it, but we'll we'll give you all a moment to um, put those comments in our chat. So we've got three books we talked about today. Mm -hmm. So no, they're there. Yes. So if you would like to try them out, and I've put the publishers on there. And so um, we've only read like short excerpts, but thank you to the publishers for our fair use there. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a, those are our three books and they are all, are all available both as eBooks and in print at the library, so. And I know you can also hear A Dark and Hollow Star in audio if you'd like to hear um, actual voice actors and hear what they do with character voices and probably Alvin Ho and Wedgie are probably also audiobooks too. Yes, I haven't checked I've, those, but they're very popular, so I'd imagine they would be. I've listened to Alvin Ho. I have not listened to Wedgie and Gizmo, but I'm sure that it's also available. So all right. Well I'm not seeing any new comments. Um so we want to thank our chatters for stopping by. So thanks to Molly. Thanks to uh, G Galley for stopping by. Thanks to Taylor. Um, thanks to anybody who else who was watching who maybe didn't feel like chatting with us, but that's okay. We see you. You're awesome. And if you were unable to check in or to, to watch us live because you didn't have internet, then thank you for watching later. <laughs> Yes, thank you to people in the future from those of us in the past. <laughs> so that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we hope that you've had a lot of fun with us and that you'll join us again next month when we are going to be talking about ghost stories. Thank you. Goodbye. Happy writing.